All right. Um, I don't ha clearly don't have as, quite as, as polished a presentation as Astra did, since I was just sort of preparing this for a short discussion <laughs> with uh, the the school rather than a full lecture. Um, so this is just the the abstract for the the talk itself. Um, okay. So basically, what I'm doing here is. Uh, I'm really interested in the commercialization and sort of mainstreaming of everything that Astrid was just talking about. Um, and, and you'll have seen that a lot of it is, is sort of avant-garde, it's independent, it's, um, it's very academic. Um, for the most part, with the exception of, of the more game-like aspects of some of these texts, uh, they are produced by uh, academics. Andy Campbell is an exception with the Nightingale's Playground. Um, but for the most part, there are people like me working in uh, literature departments and, and media departments um, sort of experimenting with form. Um, and I think that that is uh, evident in their uh, popularity or lack thereof sometimes um, because they are experiments. Um, they're, they're not, they're, it hasn't, most of the time when you say I write digital fiction, you go, oh, you do an ebook. I heard Fifty Shades of Grey is really good. <laughs> or not. Um, no, and, and it's absolutely really not what, what we do. Um, but given the uh, sort of prevalence of the book and interest people have in the book and the electronic form of the book, um, I thought it was one place, even though it's my personal opinion that digital fiction is absolutely unique and distinct from books, um, I thought, well, uh, the previous instances of playing with that form have been very experimental avant-garde. You saw um, a screenshot from Afternoon, which is sort of hailed as one of the first hypertext. But it's in a proprietary software system. You have to play it on your computer, and that's been a lot of the um, sort of bound the the I don't want to call it boundary. Um, the anyway. Uh, I have completely lost my words. Um, anyway, it makes it difficult for people to find and get into. Um, so as a writer, what I'm interested in doing is uh, trying to sort of wiggle my way into more mainstream um, approaches and seeing how we can uh, get a more mainstream public into appreciating these forms uh, it, through uh, sort of subverting what's already there and what's already popular. Um, and so what's currently popular are books. They will never not be popular. People like books. Um, and what's emerging in the past really couple of years uh, are things called twine games. I don't know if anybody, is, is anybody in here familiar with twine games? My students. Okay. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is uh, an article on Game Rant about uh, the top twine games. It's actually becoming really popular. Has anybody heard of Gamergate? Yeah. A few people. Um, so it was a really uh, hot current topic uh, last year at this time. Um, in particular, the game that sort of started it all, the game that was made and, and put on Steam, was a twine game. That's the actual platform. It's, it's a little bit um, tangential to the actual controversy of Gamergate, but the game that, that prompted it uh, was made in Twine. And you can see it's very text-based. This is a screenshot of one of the games. And so you read the text, and then you've got a hyperlink. And in this particular screen, you, there's not any choice at all. It's just a page turn, essentially, by hitting the hyperlink. You've got other um, people have compared them to sort of choose your own adventures here. You've got various choices where you can click them and move on with the game. So it's very straightforward. It really does feel like those old school choose your own adventures. If you want to do this, turn to page 92. If you don't, turn to page 3, what have you. Um, so these are becoming actually very popular. And this is the first sort of form. This is an actual screenshot from that game, which is a really fun game. If you haven't played The Uncle Who Works for Nintendo, it's, it's quite fun. Um, these are the, the first. I, apart from interactive fiction, which as Astrid mentioned was uh, a commercial gaming enterprise which sort of died in terms of gaming when graphics came in, became more feasible, although it has re-emerged as a more literary genre, 
uh, twine, uh, and they do call them twine games, it's interesting, these are called games, um, uh, was sort of, it's an open source, free source platform, um, and uh, it is not as embraced by academics. It is the first one really where it's been uh, a grassroots movement to popularize it and do it, and it's primarily because of one particular set in terms of uh, underrepresented uh, groups, uh, LGBTQ, women, uh, are. it's very popular with these groups for expressing their um, sort of experiences. So these games tend to be very literary and very personal. Uh, so I would argue that calling them twine games is a little bit disingenuous. In those cases, I do feel that they border more on these sort of narratives, personal essays, um, these sorts of things. Um, so I'm interested in twine games. My current project isn't in twine at the moment because I still think that twine is still having the same problem that um, uh, a lot of digital fiction does in that it's, it's this sort of online free sharing economy, the internet gift economy. If I write this game, I put it up and I'll welcome donations, but uh, unless you put your game on Steam, um, it is, there's not much monetary value going on, I wouldn't say value, but not much commercial exchange happening there. Um, so as a Twine game developer or Twine writer, you're not going to make a living off of it unless you're doing, making a living. A lot of them are game developers for AAA studios and things like that. So I am actually primarily interested in looking at a platform that is super well known and has a lot of mainstream commercial um, history behind it. So that's what made me sort of turn to the ebook and thinking, well, it's got an E in its title. <laughs> it should be electronic. Uh, and yet all we seem to have done with it so far is try to reproduce the printed page, uh, which is a little sad. Um, and and they, it's sort of touted as being as close to the book as possible, right? You've got the, they call them paper whites, and it's E ink. And, and all these sorts of things, and, and, and it's, you can uh, read it on the beach, you know, that sort of thing. It's not a screen. Um, it is a, it's a page, it's page turns. They even animate the page turns, even though there are no pages to turn. Um, so it's this interesting print mimicry in trying to, I bet if Amazon could, they would sell little scratch and sniff stickers for them so that they would smell like real books. Um, actually, that might be a, a wasted <laughs> business opportunity. Um, because, and, and, and they're, they're nice, and I like, I actually like holding them because I'm, I'm too lazy to hold an actual heavy book. Um, when I have to read a real book now, I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I'm interested in this, right? Kindles, e-readers are very popular, the, the market's so saturated with them, everyone has them, so certain stores have stopped even selling them because what's the point anymore? Um, and yet, I haven't seen very many uh, authors playing with the form. Um, there are hyperlinking capabilities in ebooks. You can put a hyperlink, an external hyperlink, into an ebook and have it lead off somewhere else. But obviously, most of your dedicated e readers, it becomes a problem. You're not going to get them to a site with um, color a lot of times, unless you've got one of the newer tablet based, like a Kindle Fire uh, or an iPad. Um, you may not be on Wi-Fi, and so those external hyperlinks are just then dead if you're, say, on a plane or on a beach. Um, although I think Wi-Fi is becoming more and more ubiquitous, and also there are obviously the 3G and 4G tablets type things, but nonetheless. Um, there's also the, the reader uh, expectations to deal with. They don't want to link out of the book. They just want to read the book, which, fair enough, you know, most of the time when I sit down with a book, I don't want to open up a book and it says go to here on the web. I'm like, oh, I gotta get up and go to the computer. Again, this is my laziness speaking. Oh, I've got to go to a different device. I've got to go to a different screen, what have you. So I'm not interested in external links, but what I am interested in are internal hyperlinks. Um, and I haven't seen that used. The only instance in which I've seen it used is with footnotes or endnotes. Um, this is a, an example of an endnote in a print, or, sorry, a footnote in a print book. Rather um, famously, Terry Pratchett used uh, uh, footnotes as asides in his books, um, and they really are uh, an important part of his writing. Um, and yet, the when his books are experienced in um, ebook form, 
uh, readers express frustration because the footnotes function doesn't actually work very well. You've got to click on the link, it takes you to the footnote, and it takes you back to what the e-reader, and then you click on a link to get back to the page you were on. But the e-reader typically, it doesn't, you know, the, the, depending on what size font you have, um, you're going to go through the book differently than I might go through the book. So whatever was at the top of your page now might not be at the top of your page when you get back. So it takes you to what the top of the page it thinks is regardless of you know, wherever the footnote was, so it can get very jarring for the reader. It's not nearly as seamless an experience as seeing that there's a footnote, dropping your eye down the page. I mean, when you turn the page, you're aware there's a footnote, and so there's almost an element of, oh, I'm going to find the footnote, I'm going to see it, or maybe I might preview it. There's this whole experience of the footnotes in fiction um, that just isn't well duplicated, and you see tons of discussion forums like this from either readers trying to figure out how to make it better, their experience better, or from writers who are publishing ebooks, um, especially academic books and things like that, to make the foot and endnote uh, experience better. So I started thinking about this and trying to think about um, how I could make use of these internal hyperlinks. Obviously, uh, it's it's a simple thing. It's just as easy as putting a hyperlink into Microsoft Word when you're formatting um, your ebook. Um, but I haven't seen it done very much. Um, this is an example of Arcadia by Ian Pears. This is a book that um, is being published in February 2016. It was first an app. Uh, so it's interesting, and you saw with Pry that has been going around here, again, it's an app. A lot of these sort of enhanced or electronic books that are trying to add multiple media or functionality like this, um, they come out as one-off apps. They're not developed to be part of an a, a, existing marketplace like this. In fact, I still haven't come across any. Um, Arcadia was an app, um, and it's being published in 2016 as a straightforward hardcover and Kindle book. I see no evidence in the Kindle description of hyperlinking or any duplication of the effects of the app, which uh, involved following these different characters and their story threads through and you could click around for, for different aspects of story. So it's a little disappointing. I'm hoping maybe it will be in there when it when it's released, but maybe not. Um, there are other examples. This is one that I uh, invested in as Kickstarter. It's a choose your own adventure of Hamlet, which actually was just, in its first instance, it was just a choose your own adventure of Hamlet and then it got popular so they added a bunch of different web comic artists to illustrate it, and then it got more popular. Um, and so, in the first instance, you just got a PDF with, it really was literally, if you want Hamlet to do this, go to page three. It was very straightforward. Um, and it really took off. Now you can purchase it as a Steam game. You can see it's well-developed graphics, that sort of thing. Um, or you can purchase it on, nope, that's Arcadia. Where did it go? You can also purchase it as a book on Amazon. I think I lost that, that link. So it also exists as a choose your own adventure book on Amazon. So it isn't that there's not a market for this kind of stuff. It isn't that people don't want to read good stories with this sort of formatting. It's just that so far what's out there has been too avant-garde or too experimental for your mainstream reader. I mean, Hamlet isn't, you know, a, a beach read. And yet, this makes it really fun, and people sort of get into it, and the writing is obviously distinctly different. Um, so what I've done is to, my current project, which has sort of required a lot of research, which you can kind of see here, this is the wall of Lyle's story outlining that is in my house. My husband expects strings to be going up with pins <laughs> any day now. Um, so uh, these are the eight, Eight, seven different timelines involved in the stories that are going into the current novel, which will be, you can see where there's little dotted lines going here, where all of these story worlds diverge. Um, it required a lot of research into the 20th century, 20th century history, 20th century American history, um, different divergent points to say, um, how would we be different today if Franz Ferdinand hadn't been assassinated? Uh, how would we be different today if the AIDS epidemic started 10 years earlier and in mostly black populations instead of gay populations? How would that have affected the civil rights movement? How would that have affected 
uh, different things until we get to down here, which is all the stories happening in 2015 or 2016, whenever I get done writing it, uh, with the same core character in each. So who is she in each story world? What does she do? What's, what's important to her? And how can we link her together in, in what's going on based on these different story worlds? There's just a few more images. This is, this is my original timeline, Wizard's Wife, labeled OTL, um, for histor events of historical significance, events of cultural significance. Yep, thanks, Ankara. Um, and so I go through all the way and I get points of divergence which is Franz Ferdinand survives, what happens, and all these. So that's why it's not finished yet. This took most of my study leave to, to research. Um, and actually, it all takes place in New Mexico, so it helped to have a few weeks back home where I could actually go to locations and dig into some materials that I could only find there in the university library there, as opposed to here. Um, so what I'm interested in doing is what's happening with my process as I write something like this knowing that they're going to be seven different stories and knowing that it's going into ebook form with internal hyperlinks. Um, so how does that affect how I see these stories? So I don't know what order they're going to be in. I don't know what order readers may experience them in. Um, but I still want them to be mainstream and of course I have to be somewhere else. Yes. Um, <laughs> so reminder. So I still want it to be mainstream and commercial. I still want it to work for mainstream audiences uh, along the lines of like Cloud Atlas, where it's a little bit pushing the boundaries of narrative, but you, it's still going to sell. People will still buy, hopefully. Um, and to explore reader responses uh, and, and what they do with it and whether it works as a, as a text or not. So that's the current project. It's what I did on study leave, partially. And uh, hopefully it turns out well. Wow. Thank you all for <laughs>